Welcome to the Truth Unfolds Bible Studies. I am Alejandro Fleming. The topic for today is entitled, Why Study the Bible and What Does History Have to Do With It? The Bible is an intriguing book, to say the least. Unique claims are made for it. People go as far as to maintain that it is the Word of God. Millions have cheerfully suffered horrible deaths rather than deny or disregard its teachings. And other millions stand ready today, this minute, to follow their example. So, how are we to test a book for which such high claims are made? Where can we best begin? What part is the most vulnerable? Does the Bible have qualities that make it different and unique from every other book in the world? I hope to answer these questions during this study, so stay tuned. There are two elements the God of the Bible has proclaimed concerning himself, which separates him from every other God, small letter G. And these two elements will answer the questions posed in the introduction. The first element is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 45. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. The God of the Bible says that He is the Creator and there is no other. Every artist, similar to a fingerprint, has a uniqueness about their work that separates them from others. God also has a distinctness about Himself, like no other. It is written in 1 John 4.8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. We understand by this that God not only embodies the personification of love, but that God is the essence of love. And this essence must be seen in all of his creative work, if indeed he is the God who created the world. God is love. This is the foundational teaching of the Bible. God's very nature, essence, and being are the source of life, health, and happiness, the blueprint on which life is built. He designed and constructed life to operate only in harmony with his own character because it is from him that all things hold together. Every manifestation of creative power is an expression of infinite love. God is love. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Does nature testify to the claim that God is love? Can we naturally see the law of love, which is the circle of giving embedded in nature? Let us take a look at the operation of our global water cycle. The oceans give their water to the clouds, which rain over the land, giving their waters to farm lakes, rivers, and streams, which in turn give their water to the plants and animals, ultimately giving back to the ocean to farm the cycle again. Let us take a look at another example, the relationship between humans and plants. Here we can see the law of love, the circle of giving, automated in the fabric of creation. 
when we inhale, we inhale oxygen provided by the plants. And when we exhale, we produce carbon dioxide, which is observed by the plants, forming a cycle of giving. Life as we know it is only compatible with the law of love. Without the law of love, the circle of giving, life as we know it cannot exist. God is love. There's another element God uses to distinguish himself as the only true God. God has given man an unmistakable sign that he alone is God and there is none else. With this next element, God has continued to set the bar infinitely high so that there can be no excuse when all is said and done. Here is his proclamation found in Isaiah 46. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. The second element to which God testifies that he is God and there is no one else is prophecy. We all can agree that humans are not able to see one second into the future, much less thousands of years. It is on this topic that God has an ongoing challenge to every unbeliever and skeptic. Listen, Bible prophecy burns all bridges. If the thing does not happen, no apology or excuse can be offered. We will briefly take a look at two prophecies. First, we will look at a prophecy found in Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 1 to 14, concerning the ancient city of Tyre. We do not have the time to read through these verses together, so feel free to pause the video and read the verses for yourself. I will highlight three major events from this prophecy. Number one, Nebuchadnezzar will besiege the city and slaughter many. Ezekiel, living in the time of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, under inspiration wrote that Nebuchadnezzar will destroy the city of Tyre. Tyre had two parts to it. One was the mainland and the other was a nearby island. Nebuchadnezzar besieged the mainland city in 585 to 573 BC and killed many and broke down their structures according to the prophecy although he was unsuccessful in conquering the other path. Number two, the city would be broken down and the stones, timber, and soil would be thrown in the midst of the water. Alexander the Great in the year 332 BC came against the island city. He could not defeat them by traditional means because of the water surrounding the island. What Alexander the Great decided to do next is considered one of the most brilliant military strategies in the history of warfare. The stones from the demolished mainland city, known as Old Tyre, along with timber and soil, were thrown into the midst of the sea to build a causeway bridge to the island. This is how Alexander defeated the second part of Tyre and unknowingly fulfilled another portion of Bible prophecy. Number three, the city would never be rebuilt. In 1291 AD, Tyre was conquered by the Muslims and left uninhabited until the end of the 19th century. Around that time, a new population was beginning to form. These were no longer Phoenician people. Everything from that ancient era, including their culture and language, is lost to history, and most of the remains lie beneath the present town and are scattered in the water. So, it is absolutely safe to say that Phoenician city can and will never be rebuilt again, just as Bible prophecy has foretold. Next, we will look at a fascinating prophecy found in the book of Daniel chapter 2. I will only stay on the surface of this prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream from God and his subjects could not tell the king what he dreamt and the interpretation. God showed Daniel what the king dreamt 
and God gave Daniel the interpretation. This is the king's dream. He saw a statue with a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thigh of brass, legs of iron, and his feet part of iron and part clay. Then he saw a stone that came and struck the statue at his feet and broke it into pieces. Daniel told the king that his kingdom is represented by the head of gold and three other kingdoms will come after his kingdom. In Daniel chapter 7, God expands the details of the four kingdoms with animal symbols. By providing more details, God is taking away all probability of chance or guesswork. God is making it absolutely clear that he alone holds the keys to the future. We will take a look at two eye-popping details pertaining to the third kingdom and the fourth kingdom. In Daniel chapter 8, God revealed by name that Greece will be the third kingdom and will conquer Media Persia, the second kingdom. In Daniel chapter 7, God revealed some interesting details about the third kingdom. After this, I beheld and lo another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Question. Why did God place four heads on the third kingdom? Why not the first, or the second, or the fourth? Well, history shows that when Alexander the Great died, he left no successor. So, his empire was divided between his top four generals. And just for good measure, God doubled down on this in Daniel chapter 8, verse 20 to 22 using different animal symbols, but highlighting the same outcome. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. Is this coincidence or supernatural power? You decide. Let's move on to the fourth kingdom. The Bible is, of course, not without challenge and opposition. The skeptics will argue that the book of Daniel was written in 168 BC. By choosing this date, they are seeking to destroy the spirit of prophecy by implying that the succession of kingdoms was not prophetic, but rather it was written after the fact at the time when the Roman Empire began its power. I am about to show you that even if this date is accepted, all it will do is trade one problem for another, equally complex and unsolvable through human wisdom. So if we place the writings of the book of Daniel in the second century BC, then Daniel would have the history of evidence of one universal kingdom conquered by another, thereby having a template to predict the future. So, how does one explain what Daniel wrote next concerning the fourth beast, or the fourth kingdom which should come after Greece? Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Daniel foretold something remarkably different about this fourth kingdom, contrary to the previous sequence of successions. This kingdom would not be defeated by another kingdom, but instead it would be broken up into ten parts. It is unanimously documented in history that in 476 AD, Imperial Rome was invaded by barbarian tribes and broken up into, yes, ten parts. Coincidence or supernatural power? You decide. Now, in order for the skeptics to discredit the spirit of prophecy concerning the fourth beast, they would have to again move the writing of the book of Daniel from 168 BC to 476 AD, which 
to nobody's surprise, no attempts have been made. And I understand why it would be pointless. Because this prophecy is a prophecy reaching all the way to the end of the world and the second coming of Christ. So, in essence, no matter where we move the timeline, it cannot discredit the accuracy and supernatural foreknowledge of the God of the Bible. So how much more wonderful that this prophecy was actually written according to Daniel chapter 7 verse 1 in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, around 553 BC, over 1,000 years to the fulfillment concerning the fourth beast. Coincidence or supernatural power? You decide. Time would not permit me in this video to highlight the one who is the center and heart of all prophecies, Jesus Christ the righteous. Here is a fun fact. Jesus fulfilled at the very least 300 prophecies. The probability for these predictions to be fulfilled in one man is 10 to the power of the 12th chance. Try wrap your mind around that. The Bible is the most unique book in the history of the world, no wonder it is the most translated book to this day and is not even close. The Bible tells us who created us, how we were created, what happened that caused suffering, pain, disease and death, and what is God's ultimate plan and solution to bring his creation back to its original design. As end time prophecies are being fulfilled as we speak, now is the perfect time to wipe the dust off your Bible and build a personal relationship with your loving creator. If you were blessed by this video, please like, subscribe and share. Don't forget to ring the notification bell so you do not miss another episode of The Truth Unfolds.